Good morning, everybody from Australia. My name is Sebastian Strangio, the Southeast Asia editor here at The Diplomat, and I am delighted to welcome you all to the latest in our series of Diplomat webinars, which got started um, you know, shortly after the pandemic hit um, in 2020. On the agenda today is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, in particular, what we can expect from Cambodia's chairmanship of the Southeast Asian bloc this year. Now, Cambodia formally assumed the chairmanship after the last ASEAN summit in October, but barely halfway through January, it's already prompting a good deal of controversy. On the 7th and 8th of January, Cambodia's Prime Minister Hun Sen made a state visit to Myanmar for talks aimed at resolving the crisis that has roiled the country since last February's coup. Um, and while some have applauded the Cambodian leader's energetic and proactive diplomacy on Myanmar, it's also been deeply controversial in many quarters. Uh, human rights advocates um, and many outside observers have accused Hun Sen of purposefully legitimizing the military junta that, that claims to rule Myanmar now and squandering the limited leverage that ASEAN um, had over the Myanmar military. The Cambodian government's determination to engage directly with the Myanmar military without apparent conditions has also prompted misgivings from within ASEAN itself. Several member states have come out and expressed concerns about the Cambodian government's choice and would prefer and, and express their preference that the bloc take a more robust stance um, in the face of the situation in Myanmar. To some, you know, this controversial beginning to Cambodia's chairmanship unavoidably calls to mind the controversies that surrounded its last chairmanship in 2012. Um, at that time, you know, the Cambodian delegation infamously intervened to block the release of a joint statement that was critical of Chinese actions in the South China Sea. Um, and of course, this, this, you know, this hints at sort of the other, the other issue that is likely to overshadow Cambodia's chairmanship this year, its close relationship with China. And given that this relationship has only grown closer over the last decade, um, you know, how this impacts Cambodia's chairmanship and or perceptions of it um, is, is a crucial question that I'll, I hope we can get to today. Um, and all of these, you know, all of this, you know, it suggests that Cambodia's chairmanship of ASEAN in 2022 will be watched and analyzed unusually closely by people both within the region and outside of it. And so to ponder how things have begun and where they might go over the coming 10 months, we're very privileged today to be joined by a distinguished panel of regional commentators and experts. Our first speaker is Ambassador Pu Sotirak from Phnom Penh, a former Cambodian ambassador to Japan and minister for industry, mines and energy Ambassador Sotirak currently serves as the executive director of the Cambodian Institute for Cooperation and Peace in the Cambodian capital Phnom Penh. Also beaming in from home quarantine in Kuala Lumpur is Alina Noor, the director for political security affairs and deputy director of the Washington DC office of the Asia Society Policy Institute. Uh, Alina's work focuses on security developments in Southeast Asia, including the, the disputes in the South China Sea, on global governance and technology and on preventing and countering violent extremism. And rounding out our trio of panelists is Aaron Connolly, who works at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in Singapore and leads the Institute's research on Southeast Asian politics and its interactions with the region's foreign policy. Prior to joining the IISS, Aaron was the first director of the Southeast Asia Project at the Lowy Institute in Sydney, where I first became familiar with his work. All three of our panelists are veteran ASEAN watchers, and I'm sure they'll have all have many in interesting things to say about you know, where Cambodia's chairmanship is likely to go over the coming year. So before we get uh, things started with our panelists, I want to just uh, mention a few things about our format. Um, I will initially ask each of the three panelists to speak for about 10 minutes on um, various aspects of today's topic. Um, after which I will potentially pose a question or two of my own to the panel. After that, we'll move on to the Q&A. Um, if you have any questions for our experts, please leave them in the, you know, submit them in the chat box um, and, and I'll make a selection of questions to ask our panelists um, you know, in the, after the, the initial phase of the, of the panel. And so without further ado, I would like to call on, firstly, on Ambassador Sotirak to kick off our proceedings by giving us some sense of how the Cambodian government 
um, is approaching its year at the helm of ASEAN. And perhaps to give us a bit of a, a sense of the thinking that underpins uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen's controversial outreach to Myanmar. Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank my good friend Sebastian for engaging me in this very important uh, discussion. I also feel very honored to be uh, uh, among um, good friends, uh, Eleanor and Aaron, for uh, a talk on what many anticipated and try to understand what is uh, about to happen or will happen during 2012. So, um, during 2012, as an upcoming chair of ASEAN for the third time, Cambodia is about to prove its ability to handle a daunting task during a highly critical time where ongoing hindering and challenging remain, challenge remain to be overcome and to rally all ASEAN members to effectively navigate external power who compete relentlessly for greater influence in the region of Southeast Asia. Now, I will say a few words about some of the challenging tasks faced by Cambodia as a 2012 ASEAN chair and highlight some of the priority that the chair should focus on. And these are just my personal view only. Overall, during the course of 2012, Cambodia must assess correctly the evolving regional and global insecurity landscape. This requires Cambodia to remain vigilant and creative so as to manage challenges and address issues that stand in the ASEAN way in improving its relevance and secure its interests in the long term while meeting the challenge and the dynamic of the regional and global development. Under the themes of addressing challenge together, Cambodia must succeed in creating new momentum for ASEAN as a whole to confront and to address squarely difficult challenges to safeguard ASEAN continued relevant viability and vitality. One of the biggest challenges for Cambodia this year is how the new chair is able to work together collaboratively among other member states to keep ASEAN centrality relevant by addressing vigorously traditional and non-traditional security challenges, which constantly testing the association credibility. ASEAN has been often criticized as a forum for only talk and not enough action due to its consensual way of non-substantive reaction toward today pressing challenges. As still, ASEAN still need to be able to come up with appropriate solution with such hard security issue relating to the competing sovereignty claims in the South China Sea, with resolving Myanmar crisis, appeasing the US-China competition, addressing threat related to the management of the Mekong River, overcoming dreadful impact of COVID-19 and tackling all the outstanding non-traditional threat such as climate change and the decline of democratic principles and human rights protection in this part of the world. As chair, the Cambodian must lead ASEAN to address resolutely this year by showing exceptional leadership if Cambodia wishes to maintain its astute image as the last member of ASEAN and prove its ability as no stranger to share to sharing ASEAN. Specifically, as Cambodia will have to prove its credibility as an effective ASEAN chair at the time when the outlook on issues like the South China Sea remain uncertain and when there are serious doubt about ASEAN own centrality and unity amid wider regional and global trend, including the military coup in Myanmar, controlling the pandemic outbreak, resuscitating the world economy or regional economy, reinvigorating the healthcare system, managing big power competition, and so on and so forth. In managing external relations with all major power for this year, Cambodia should maintain its credi credibilities as being masterful at balancing 
major power to prevent ASEAN as a whole from taking side with one power or the other. As doing so is considered as ceding the initiative to manage ASEAN destiny to an outside, an outside power and will weaken ASEAN bargaining power with that power in the protections of regional interests. Internally speaking, it is important. It is normally expected that the, that the, the chair of ASEAN, Cambodia, uh, is in a case in point, is awaiting to perform three duty in my view. First, serving as spokesman of the 10 member regional organization. Second, play a role of chief executive in chairing and facilitating official meetings and, ta and task force. And third, bringing forward new initiative and program to advance regional corporations. Cambodia must also assume its informal role as consensus builder that is most important, but often overlooked. ASEAN high threshold of unanimity require full consensus agreement and require the chair to exhibit wise leaderships and diplomatic acumen to find common ground between divergent view among ASEAN member states on numerous sensitive issues of common interest and concern. And this is no easy task given the fact that member states often place national interests about common regional interests. Cambodia ASEAN chair over the course of this year will also be evaluated again, Phnom Penh ab ability to rally all external power and development partner to stand firmly behind ASEAN way and to impress them with the ASEAN centrality in addressing regional and global issues. ASEAN credibility will be put into question if the chair is seen as privileged one party over the other or bow to external demands. In an impartial chair enhance ASEAN credibility by facilitating intra-ASEAN consensus building and serving as an effective interlocutor with external party. I want to say a few words about what had transpired during 2012. Uh, many uh, still, uh, I, I think this is a uh, kind of like a nightmare that is haunting over and over again over Cambodia. All those Cambodia successfully hosted and chaired the 21st ASEAN Summit, the first ASEAN US leader meeting, and the seventh East Asia Summit in November 2012, which was also attended by President Barack Obama of the United States and other related summit. ASEAN credibility and unity were at stake on the issues of South China Sea. The non issuance of the ASEAN joint communique was the result of no consensus among ASEAN members, especially two members of ASEAN claimant state, the meant to include the contentious issues of the ex exclusive economic zone and the Scarborough Shore in the South China Sea, of which Cambodia feel it is not appropriate. For this reason, Cambodia was perceived as being biased to China while the DOC and the joint statement on the 10th anniversary of the DOC has been adopted in Cambodia to help resolve the dispute peacefully, which significantly contributed to easing the tension in the region. It is in my view also unfortunate that the failure of this joint communique overshadow ASEAN six point principle on the South China Sea, which were agree almost immediately following the shuttle diplomacy by the then Indonesian foreign minister, Mati Natagalava in 2012, following ASEAN breakdown in Phnom Penh over the South China Sea. Now, I wanted to also touch briefly with regard to uh, Myanmar crisis. The postponement of the retreat mean that ASEAN is deeply divided over Myanmar issue, but also an indication that Cambodia prefer to rethink it proactive engagement with the Tatmadaw. I'm not surprised if there is a lot of backdoor diplomacy going on right now to rescue ASEAN first meeting of the year to allow Cambodia to redress the situation and to get on rightly with its role as ASEAN chair this year. Going forward, 
Cambodia next move will be scrutinized by more influential ASEAN member states such as Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Singapore. It is important that Cambodia pay serious attention to keep ASEAN unity and be willing to make adjustment necessary to maintain ASEAN centrality and cohesiveness. Now, I would just simply say with regard to major power com competition, Cambodia need to strike a better balance between China and US as well as there are, as because there are other flashpoints to be resolved in the region besides dealing with the Tatmadaw. Now I stop here and I'd be very happy to engage in uh, 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 the preceding um, uh, session. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Sotirak. Um... Alina, I'd like to call on you now to, to deliver some comments. I mean, the ASPI recently put out quite a detailed report on the South China Sea disputes. And so I was wondering if you might be able to, you know, illuminate us as to the likely uh, approach that Cambodia will take or how the South China Sea disputes might figure in its chairmanship in, in, uh, uh, in 2022. And also, if you have any thoughts about Sotirak's, um, uh, you know, rendering of the events that took place in 2012. Yeah, thanks very much, Sebastian, for having me at this event. It's been a while since I've seen Ambassador Sotirak, so it's a real pleasure to be together with uh, both him and Aaron um, to thank you for this opportunity. I think uh, there are several things at play here. Thank you for mentioning the um, ASPE report, Sebastian, um, the one in DC, not the one in Australia. But um, I think what we've seen uh, from the report is that the South China Sea continues to be a significant issue, particularly, of course, for their frontline Southeast Asian states, including Indonesia, that's affected by China's claims uh, in the South China Sea. To take a step back, it's important to understand as well the background that we're operating in right now. Um, Mr. Sotirat pointed this out, there are competing priorities, both domestic and international, that ASEAN countries will have to face. And the domestic priorities, health and economic recovery will of course be top of the list. So the issue is whether ASEAN states, including um, Cambodia as chair, will be focused enough on an issue like the South China Sea if there are no immediate flashpoints um, that are out there at sea. Also, I think we have to take into account that given the difficult economic circumstances that many Southeast Asian countries are in, even the more influential countries, as Ambassador Sotirak categorized them, um, the economic ties that many of these countries in the region have with the major powers, such as China in particular, will figure into some of the decisions um, that relate to the South China Sea. Now, with particular regard to Cambodia's chairmanship uh, back in 2012, I think that shadow still remains even though it's been 10 years, and it goes to the issue of the reputation and credibility of not just Cambodia's ASEAN chair this year, but any ASEAN chair, um, given how close many Southeast Asian states have grown to China um, out of necessity, but also out of choice. I think for Cambodia in particular, the fact that ASEAN failed to produce a joint statement 10 years ago, uh, and the fact that countries within ASEAN and beyond ASEAN will not let Cambodia live that down even till today, I think is testament not only to how Cambodia handled it um, in 2012, but also um, a testament to ASEAN's own perhaps lack of unity, lack of centrality that continues to plague us today. There is of course good reason to be wary of a repeat performance this year uh, with Cambodia as chairman of ASEAN again particularly since we've seen similar shades of truculence and defensiveness from Phnom Penh on the issue of Myanmar that I'm sure Aaron will talk about. Um, but I think it's important to also be fair to Cambodia. We're still in the early days of Cambodia's chairmanship. We know that last year, Prime Minister Hun Sen made clear that Cambodia's stance on the South China Sea is to promote strict implementation of the uh, Declaration and Code of Conduct um, and for countries to keep negotiating for a COC. A positive reading of the 2012 chairmanship and its implications for 
uh, Cambodia this year is that Cambodia will want to avoid a reputational blow the same way it did in 2012. But it would also behoove ASEAN to avoid that similar reputational blow if it were to prove itself to not only the world, but also to the region and the younger generation of Southeast Asia, which is really starting to question the relevance and viability of ASEAN. Interestingly, this November would mark a full 20 years since the signing of the DOC, uh, which was done in Phnom Penh, and um, I'm also under Cambodia's ASEAN chairmanship. So I think it would be particularly significant if a COC were to be concluded this year, as uh, some, uh, especially China, seems eager to do. The question is, separate from the one on reputation and credibility, is of substance. And I think the real issue is that the frontline states, particularly Vietnam, the Philippines, but also to, uh, for Malaysia and even Indonesia. Uh, the question is, would a pro forma COC sped through the process simply to be passed through this year for the sake of time, would that be sufficient for these countries? And I would venture to say that it would not, uh, particularly if the COC is meant to be effective in some ways, there's already a lot of criticism we all know over how it might play out. Um, but if there is a meaningless COC, then there is no point in rushing it through this year, especially since the DOC itself is almost dead. Um, there's a lot of talk and ASEAN keeps making these statements about implementing the DOC. But I think if we're all honest with ourselves, the letter and the spirit of the DOC has not been followed for many, many years. And it doesn't take uh, genius to see that. Um, it's very clear with what's happening at sea right now. Uh, finally, I think there's an interesting development, of course, playing out now with Indonesia calling for a meeting amongst uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, uh, and Brunei on the South China Sea. And there are two ways this could go, at least two ways. One is that it cements uh, the bonds between these countries, particularly those uh, claiming rights and territories in the South China Sea. But it will also potentially entrench the fissures in ASEAN itself, since it leaves out Thailand, uh, Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia. And I think there would need to be a lot of creative diplomacy and political sensitivities, a lot of negotiations behind the scene with Cambodia as chair in order to, for this process, this parallel process to be palatable to Cambodia as the ASEAN chair. Because otherwise, the split within ASEAN will only get much worse closer to the end of this year. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm happy to continue the conversation later. Thanks, Alina. Um, now let's turn to Myanmar. Um, Aaron, you've been watching, you know, ASEAN's diplomacy on Myanmar very closely over the past year. Um, uh, you know, how do you interpret Hun Sen's proactivity on the Myanmar question? Do you think this is simply, you know, a case of doing the bidding of China, which, which, which seemingly wants to legitimize and normalize um, the, the junta's control of the country, or is there more at play? Yeah, thanks, Sebastian. Thanks for inviting me to participate this morning, and uh, also to Alina and, and Ambassador Sotarak for their comments. I think, you know, look, uh, ASEAN's diplomacy um, has been much maligned over Myanmar over the past year, uh, but it has constantly surprised its critics uh, if given a, a, enough time. And I think, you know, we're seeing a process play out uh, within ASEAN uh, that is um, uh, reflecting a shift in the median position of the member states with regard to the junta's, uh, with regard to the junta and the coup on February 1st. And I think the events of the past month actually reflect a continuing shift uh, in, in the median position of the member states with regard to the coup. So I guess I would say, you know, first of all, uh, Hun Sen, if you go back to the ASEAN leaders meeting uh, or in, uh, in, in April of last year, played a very active role in that meeting. He's one of the few leaders of ASEAN who often departs from his talking points in leaders' meetings um, and sort of speaks off the cuff. In that meeting, according to people who were present, uh, he was very critical of Minong Klang and said, you know, you can't uh, sort of call these people terrorists. And he drew on 
what he regards as his experience as a, a peacemaker in Cambodia to advise Minung Hlaing on how he should approach the issue. And clearly, Minung Hlaing didn't take that advice. And so I think if you take that as a starting point, it didn't appear as though things were getting off to a particularly good start between the new junta and, uh, and Hun Sen, Prime Minister Hun Sen. So I think it's worth recognizing that. There were a lot of assumptions that because Hun Sen uh, went through a similar experience in 1997 uh, with regard to ASEAN and Cambodia's chairmanship being delayed after the events uh, that took place that year or the, the previous year, uh, that he would have a, a different view. And uh, as it turns out, um, you know, throughout that year, he was relatively supportive of the approach that was taken by Brunei. And even up until the ASEAN summits in October, when uh, he was very clear in saying that uh, ASEAN was not excluding Myanmar, that Myanmar had given up its right. So he seemed comfortable at that point with Brunei's decision as chair to exclude Minang Klang from the summits um, and was supportive of that, of that decision. Uh, and thought that Myanmar should have sent a non-political representative, re representative to represent Myanmar. What's happened over the last month is interesting because I think it reflects a shift both in Cambodia's position, but also in the position of the maritime ASEAN member states. Um, and the shift in Cambodia's position is interesting and I think has been ill-explained. We still don't really know why the position has shifted uh, as it has, but my sense is that there are those within the Cambodian system who saw this as an opportunity for Cambodia to have a respectable chairmanship to redeem some of the reputational damage that was done in 2012. And we can talk later about whether or not that reputational damage was fairly attributed to Cambodia or not. Clearly, Ambassador Sotirak has a, a sort of different view than the, what the consensus has, has become over the last 10 years. But they saw this as an opportunity to have a respectable chairmanship. Uh, I think Praxa Khan, Foreign Minister Praxa Khan's uh, initial approach to Myanmar in late December was to uh, follow Brunei's precedent, but to invite Foreign Minister Wunamong Lin to the ASEAN uh, Foreign Minister's retreat uh, this week in Siem Reap, um, and expected that Wunamong Lin was going to get an earful from ASEAN member states as to the lack of the implementation of the five-point consensus, and that he would then use that as the special envoy of the chair to pressure Myanmar to actually implementing some of those five points. Um, but the, uh, but he, whatever his plans were, they were overtaken by Hun Sen's plans. And I'm not sure that the coordination between Hun Sen and Praxa Khan is as close as perhaps the coordination between um, uh, the Sultan uh, and, and uh, Yusuf Aryawan Ar was last year. Uh, and Hun Sen's vision of himself as this kind of peacemaker who could break the deadlock in Myanmar if he would just go there seems to have overtaken whatever approach Cambodia MFA um, had anticipated implementing to the crisis. Uh, and Cambodia now appears committed to pursuing this form of engagement. Um, whether or not they take bearings based on the reaction to other ASEAN member states uh, over the past week to its approach to diplomacy with Myanmar, I think is is an open question. It, it's probably a debate that's happening in Phnom Penh right now, whether they realize that this approach has not been popular with us, other ASEAN member states and that more consultation is required, um, or if they double down on this diplomacy. I don't think we know the answer to that question yet. But I just also wanted to point out that there's also been a shift in the position of other ASEAN member states, particularly uh, Malaysia really moving the other maritime ASEAN member states toward a harder line on Myanmar over the past month. It was not really implied in Brunei's decision to exclude Minang Klang from the summits that no ministers would take place, would uh, participate in ASEAN meetings over the course of 2022. But that is the position that Malaysian Foreign Minister Saifuddin Abdullah has taken. Um, and it is a slightly harder line than the one that was implemented by Brunei last year. And so you have these two, uh, two uh, I don't wanna call them blocks, but these two groups within ASEAN that are moving further apart on this critical question. Uh, and Malaysia really led the charge in terms of, uh, I, my understanding is that Foreign Minister Saifuddin said that he had to attend a parliamentary hearing on the terrible floods uh, that have taken place in Malaysia over the past month. Uh, and that very quickly thereafter, Foreign Minister Retno Marsudi um, said that uh, she would be unable to travel to Siem Reap because of uh, COVID regulations in Indonesia. And indeed, the State Secretary has issued one restricting travel. I think she probably could have traveled if she wanted to. 
um, and that Singapore and the Philippines were also prepared to not attend the meeting. This is a very serious uh, split. It's a very serious issue for Cambodia's diplomacy. And I think it gets Cambodia's chairmanship off to a start that they had not envisioned a month ago. I think they believed that they were going to be handling this issue uh, in a way that attracted much less scrutiny. Um, and so I think probably the best thing for Cambodia MFA and for Prime Minister Hun Sen, who is clearly the real decider here, is to take bearings on what has happened and to uh, try and apply a different approach. There is still, I think, a consensus to be found within ASEAN as to how to handle the Myanmar issue. Um, Alina wrote in an op-ed last year for foreign policy that ASEAN could suspend uh, Cambodia. It hasn't actually done that. It's, this is a kind of de facto suspension at the leader and ministerial level. But that uh, individual ASEAN countries could continue to engage uh, Myanmar at, sorry, I should, should have said uh, suspend Myanmar, um, uh, but that they could continue to engage Myanmar at a bilateral level. Um, and so I think there is a kind of consensus around that approach, the details of which still need to be worked out. Um, I did want to say a few things on 2012 and also on the South China Sea, uh, but I think I'll leave that to later. The, the one thing that I just say now is it's worth noting that Cambodia uh, seems to see the chairmanship this year as a real opportunity. Uh, I think many would have, would have seen it as a burden, trying to complete a code of conduct, uh, dealing with the Myanmar uh, crisis. But the Cambodia MFA in particular seems to see this as an opportunity to show off the economic development that Cambodia has enjoyed over the past 10 years but also to redeem the legacy of 2012, uh, regardless of what is said publicly about, about the events of 2012. Um, and I think uh, you know, th this is actually an opportunity for Cambodia to do those things uh, if it doesn't allow the theatrics over its Myanmar diplomacy to get in the way of that. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Um, so, um, I've got just you know one question to kick things off before we go to the Q and A, and I'm I'm curious you know as to what the panelists think about, um, you know the broader U.S. Chinese competition and and sort of you know how Cambodia might seek to, you know represent ASEAN in the midst of this um, you know this competition, which seems to infuse every issue. Um, we've got you know even the question of Myanmar to some extent being, uh, you know. Um, Ref, you know, reflecting, you know, the, the sort of competition between the US and China. Um, and the perception of Cambodia in the United States over the past decade has has soured considerably. I mean, you know, a country that was once mostly overlooked in Washington is now seen as kind of a, uh, you know, a, a client state of China. Um, and, and, you know, a country that is, you know, bent on sort of doing China's bidding. Um, you know, you know, what impact do you think that this perception, you know, in the US and in other Western countries could have on Cambodia's, um, you know, ability to sort of steer ASEAN through, um, you know, what could well be a fairly tumultuous year? Um, uh, Sotirak, Ambassador Sotirak, perhaps, could you, do you have any thoughts on that question? Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I want to first congratulate Elena and Aaron for making such a sound statement about the issues surrounding Cambodia chairmanship. I really uh, learned new angle and also uh, quite uh, agree with how they read uh, these stations. Now, I'm very pleased to hear Sebastian raise issues of US and China competitions. Um, I, I would say this that post COVID world order, you will see more in the intensifications of US and China getting at each other throat even more fiercely than uh, one would think that under Biden, there will be a more softer stand and the reaction from China just uh, getting more aggressive as well. So you will see more competition, more uh, these two power will, uh, really will their tussle over the region and try as much as they say they want they don't want ASEAN or individual country to take style it is precisely what they do they want states in the region to take size you know and I just want to point out a few points that of our contentious uh, with regard to this competition first it's about multilateralism uh, and the, uh, the, the world order that we know of, the liberal uh, world order that was uh, created after World War II and led by the US 
is now fiercely contested by the so-called uh, socialism with China characteristic, uh, the version that uh, uh, Xi Jinping is now uh, producing or even practicing until today. And this put a lot of pressures on state like uh, Cambodia, but before Cambodia, we have to talk about ASEAN. Cambodia won't, in my view, will not be safe to move away from ASEAN stand with this regard. What is it ASEAN stand with the US and China? ASEAN does not want to take sides, as I mentioned. If you take side, you, you finish. And it was not the creation, the, the purpose of creating this, um, this association anyway. We, we're supposed to be neutral. You know, we will have to maintain our strategic autonomy, so to speak. But uh, it's not very easy to do it. Um, on the one hand, I have to uh, also, my observation is that China is doing a lot more, much better than the US in the sense that their influence is much more uh, receptible here in this part of the world and more so for my country than any other country um, for that matter. So, but that doesn't mean that Cambodia should put all the eggs in one basket either. My view is that we need to balance it. We need to be friend to all. And we need to really, when we say this, we need to behave like that as well. And therefore foreign policy options for Cambodia is to be pragmatic, to be, to diversify our, our good friend or big brother, so to speak. We need to also allow US to freely engage in this region. But you know, one, uh, one sort of uh, negative aspects of uh, the US over Cambodia with regard to uh, policy, foreign policy toward my country is concerned is that I feel that the US does not have a very specific strategy for Cambodia. They see Cambodia through China land all the time, and this is not healthy for any state. Uh, be it Cambodia or any other country. And therefore, I think the US need to uh, perhaps recalibrate that view that Cambodia is a client state to China all the time. Um, we, we, we the last to join ASEAN, we very young state. I think we learned the rope, there is some hiccup, but to say bluntly that Cambodia is blindly choosing China, it's an understatement. I don't believe that this is, a, this is by strategic choice. We, our strategic choice in my view is to embrace all, make everybody as our friend, small or big, uh, Japan, Australia, Korea, uh, the EU for that matter. Uh, and there are uh, indication that uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen have made it uh, repeatedly but the problem with that is that, uh, you know, uh, engagement with the Western countries come at the price. You need to take their norms and value that attached to it, particularly issues related to democracy, freedom of expressions, human rights, corruptions, and so on and so forth. These are, uh, these are historical baggages that um, uh, 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 state or, or developing country have different free lunch. You, you take my money. I don't need to ask you to do anything. Just take it, you know, but that I don't believe it either. <laughs> Too easy. So anyway, um, I say this much. I don't think that um, uh, Cambodia need to uh, need to, uh, to practice what it say when we say that we want to be friend to all. Therefore, we need to engage America at the same or on the same footing with China and allow America some freedom to uh, come in into this region. The American positions in, in this part of the world is beneficial to Cambodia long-term as well, in my view. Therefore, we need to also allow that to happen. And we also need to uh, assess our, our foreign policy toward China. Our image is not so great, um, but. I think uh, 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 His Excellency Prasakon, the foreign minister, is a liberal. He, he have a liberal view, and he understands this very well. Thank you. Okay, and Aaron, Alina, do you have any thoughts to add on on the question of Cambodia in the midst of U.S.-China competition? I'll just be very brief because I know there are questions to get to. Um, I think 
being in Washington, I think personally, it's a real shame that Washington has been so dismissive of Cambodia over the last few years and has not really attempted to change its perception of, of Cambodia beyond imposing this lens of China onto it, even as Cambodia is the chair of ASEAN this year. And I think in the long run, this will backfire for the United States even more, particularly with how mercurial Hun Sen is, and especially if he or um, Hun Mane or anybody and his family stays on uh, to lead Cambodia. I think the position that Japan has taken, um, being more open and welcoming of some of the, let's say, uh, less traditional ways of Cambodia's ASEAN chairmanship so far and its handling of Myanmar, is perhaps to be a lesson that might be useful for other countries that view Cambodia solely through the US-China uh, competition lens. I think I'd just add to this. Uh, one really key decision for Cambodia as chair will be how it handles the US request to hold a special summit in the United States this year. And uh, keep in mind, a special summit was held virtually with China last year, and Myanmar was not present there. And that was a very closely run thing. Uh, there was a real push by China to try and get Minang Klang in Myanmar's seat for that summit. Uh, ASEAN held the line based on the precedent set by Brunei for the summits in October, and Cambodia was comfortable with that approach. Um, if Cambodia then applies a different standard for a special summit with the United States uh, in the US and says that it has to be ASEAN 10, that Myanmar has to attend at the leader level, then that summit won't go forward. And I think we have to wonder why Cambodia would push that particular line. Uh, my understanding is that hasn't happened yet, but there are noises coming out of Phnom Penh about uh, insistence on ASEAN 10 formulations as opposed to ASEAN 9 formulations. And so that will be seen as a metric of whether or not Cambodia is indeed being even-handed and neutral in its chairmanship and open to good relations with all. But I, I would agree with Alina that um, over the past several years, Cambodia has begun to be seen in Washington as a Chinese client state. Um, and I think sometimes this view shades into caricature uh, there are aspects of the way that Cambodia conducts its international relations that are not actually um, consistent with that of a client state. One example you might look at is its uh, uh, position on AUKUS. And Malaysia and Indonesia were very opposed to AUKUS, their foreign ministers in particular, uh, but that hasn't been the case from Cambodia, at least that's not the official position. Uh, maybe there's a little bit more real politique in uh, Phnom Penh than in uh, in Kemalu and in Wismaputra. But I think that, um, you know, that's an example of the way that Cambodia uh, has, you know, is potentially, uh, uh, the way that Cambodia is a little bit less uh, of the character that is sometimes portrayed in Washington. I was in DC, Lelina lives there, and so I should defer to her on this, but um, I was in DC last month and I got the sense that there is not really a coherent policy from the United States on what it wants out of Cambodia or how to get those things. I think there was uh, earlier in the past decade, um, and I'm not sure that the new administration has uh, that policy yet. Um, perhaps that's just uh, sort of new administration issues and they'll get there eventually, but um, I think it has been challenging for them. And some of the things that we've seen come out of the administration over the past several months have been kind of lowest con common denominator measures. They're things the interagency inter can agree on uh, but that aren't part of a broader strategy in terms of how the United States wants to uh, influence Cambodia's position on these issues, and, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, and I tend to agree. I think that, you know, the Cambodia has always been sort of, you know, is never being viewed as strategically important enough to, to command a huge amount of attention in Washington. Um, um, and that's put it always, often in a sort of difficult position. Um, now, we've got a lot of questions here that uh, from our audience that relate to ASEAN more generally. Um, I'll, I'll try and focus on ones that refer specifically to Cambodia's chairmanship. We've got quite an interesting one here from Gordon Kanochi, which asks whether having a different foreign minister in charge. In 2012, Cambodia's longtime foreign minister, uh, Hornam Hong, was in charge, um, whereas with, you know, with Prak Sakon's um, appointment to the position, I believe, in 2016, um, you know, I was wondering if, if the panelists have any views on, you know, whether this change in personnel at the top of Cambodia's MFA will 
you know, influence or inflect its approach toward uh, its chairmanship in 2022? Maybe I could just uh, start, and then I'd be very curious as Ambassador Sotirak's comments on that, and perhaps I can I can prompt him to to reply. I, I think what happened in 2012 was really down to two factors. One was Foreign Minister Ho Nam Hong, more than Cambodia as a state or as an entity, uh, and down to Chinese influence. Um, and so the key shift that was made during the ASEAN Foreign Ministers meeting in 2012. Hornam Hong was willing to negotiate originally, um, but at some point he stopped negotiating. And this is what most ASEAN member states fault Cambodia for. It is not that Cambodia had a position that the uh, Chinese actions in Vietnam's EEZ not be mentioned or that Scarborough Shoal not be mentioned. There were other ministers, including uh, Martin Algawa, who were sympathetic to the view that perhaps it would be a, a unwise to include some of these uh, specifics in the joint communique. The thing that people fault Cambodia for in 2012 amongst the other ASEAN member states is that at some point Hornam Hong excluded himself from the discussions and not just as the foreign minister of Cambodia but also as the chair of ASEAN in that, in that situation. And so while the other ministers, the other nine, were gathered around a computer trying to negotiate forms of language that might be acceptable to everyone, uh, Hornam Hong decided to quit negotiating. He, in the words of one minister, closed up shop. I don't think that would be Pratsokan's approach. Um, I think that there's a recognition in Cambodia that uh, this was a mistake and that Pratsokan won't make that mistake again. Um, I think it's also worth noting that ASEAN's um, uh, practice has changed over time. In 2012, it was very much expected that the joint communique would be released uh, at the conclusion of the ASEAN foreign ministers meeting. That's changed over time. In 2016, for the first time, uh, it wasn't released on time, but it was released a few days later after continued consultations between the ministers after they went back home to their capitals. Um, and then we've seen similar practice in 2020 and 2021 when these things have been held virtually. And so uh, there's more room to make sure that you get to an agreement uh, later on. Uh, the second issue was just uh, Chinese influence over Cambodia's position at that time. I know that this is a subject um, that is uh, delicate to, to discuss in Phnom Penh, but many delegations say that Hornam Hong consulted with third parties outside of the room, and that um, after he came back to the room, there was a change in his approach to the negotiations. And so uh, that is perhaps something that, that won't change. There will continue to be third party influence uh, over the chair this year, but perhaps even China recognizes that this was not ultimately good for it. Um, to try and influence ASEAN proceedings in such an overt way that led to such, uh, uh, that really sort of led to the questioning of the legitimacy of its proxy in those conversations, that that actually wasn't good for China either. I'm not sure that they actually recognize that, but they should. Um, and so perhaps there will be a change there as well. Ambassador Sotirak, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I would say this, that uh, personality and style of leadership matter in any uh, ones you have, uh, uh, if you have a position of a Minister of Foreign Affairs, definitely there, there is a uh, different personality, different style of leaderships and so on. But one thing uh, you need to also take into consideration is the environment, the, the issues surrounding uh, Cambodia during 2012 and today is much, much different. Uh, and from 2012 to now, 10 years on, um, many things evolve. As I mentioned, we, we learn the road, you know? And I agree, I, I do not believe that there, there will be a repeat of uh, 2012. In other words, there will be joint statement, uh, joint communique issues on, uh, on uh, South China Sea because not having one, uh, it is just too uh, negative for image. And this is, uh, perhaps uh, something that um, um, well, need a, 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 a more debate, like uh, Elena was talking about the COC, you know, it would be best if we can have it uh, during Cambodia's chairmanship this year, but I doubt it. I seriously doubt that it would be, it would happen. Not, not because Cambodia don't want it, we want it, but we are now claiming. <laughs> and then uh, you have to talk about China core interests in here. 
and they are so persistent that bilateral dealing is a way forward. So any code that favor international rulings, you know, um, binding international unclause and all these things will not be very well perceived by China. And when China doesn't agree, I don't think COC can, can, can take shape. Uh, and so China is very good in, you know, China, China live a long, um, when, when it comes to time, China probably have the best uh, management of time. You know, they, as long as you can live on to it, they will live on to it. <laughs> and then uh, slowly you will be somehow uh, absorbed into what China want to do. But anyway, um, come back to Cambodia, uh, the, the different personalities and the different context and circumstance surrounding issue does play a role. And I think moving forward for Cambodia, I, I do believe that we want to also capitalize on uh, making sure that we, we repair the damage that has been done. Uh, that is to say the glitch that have happened. We, uh, we have to re-explain the position perhaps and even with the, um, among the claimant state and non-claimant state, you know, um, uh, Sebastian's and Aaron's were talking about the maritime state now is taking a lead with regard to uh, positions in Myanmar, but not only in Myanmar issues, but the South China Sea issues as well. I see that is coming as well. What surprised me is that uh, of all these things, Vietnam remained very, very silent um, with regard to anything, the retreat, the postponement, nothing at all. Um, mm. That is very surprising uh, to me. Um, a country to be also observed or to at least try to understand as we move into the, the Cambodian chairmanship is Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam probably is a front state that is really defending a, a binding code that is uh, uh, legally binding, that's the word, you know, and rule-based approach. Um, but it has been very quiet. We have to wait and see what happened. So again, um, going forward, as I mentioned, uh, Cambodia will be closely watched by big state, um, how we move with Myanmar, but as well as with the other things, uh, issues like um, um, South China Sea and also US-China rivalry, how Cambodia wanted to position ourselves. We said we multilateralism, we meaning uh, ASEAN, in Cambodia, but how multilateralism, uh, what is the ASEAN way of multilateralism? You know, it's, it's just bring issues to the table or tackle real issues, the conflicting view between US and China on rule-based international order and multilateralism. So I stop here, thank you. Okay, yes, and I mean, you know, relating to the question about person, the personalities of the Cambodian foreign ministers, obviously we, we can't, uh, we can't sidestep the question of the personality of the guy in charge, namely Prime Minister Hun Sen and his self-perceptions and um, questions of legacy that are driving his role, his predominant role in setting the terms of Cambodia's chairmanship. And we have a question here from an anonymous attendee on exactly this topic. You know, um, we've already spoken about Hun Sen wanting to leave a legacy, perhaps to sort of wipe away the, you know, redeem the kind of, um, bad reputation that Cambodia acquired in 2012. But there's also this question of Hun Sen's view of himself as a peacemaker. And, and you know, it, and sort of the attendee asks, are there any lessons from the Cambodian experience, namely the end of Cambodia's civil war in the 1990s, that are applicable to the situation in Myanmar today that, that might, um, you know, bring to bear some benefits or some, some lessons that might help the situation there? And are there any risks of seeing the current situation in Myanmar through the lens of the, you know, the conflict of Cambodia 25 to 30 years ago? Elena, uh, do you have any thoughts about, you know, about that? I, uh, I would not want to speak on behalf of the Cambodian experience and I'd actually like to hear Ambassador Sokirak's view on that. I don't feel it's my place as a Malaysian. Sure. <laughs> Ambassador Sotirak, do you have any 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 views on sort of the pa any parallels that might exist between Cambodia's experience and and the the situation in uh, Myanmar today? Yeah, I I uh, first and foremost, I think you talk about Prime Minister Sen legacy. I would perhaps uh, downgrade that a little bit, or we can discuss about uh, that. But that is way too far in, in advance. Uh, Prime Minister Sen 
often say that he will rule until he cannot rule anymore. So, and then there's a lot of talk about his grooming up his son to take over and so on. Uh, the debate will go on uh, in Cambodia, but um, I see it as an opportunity, the situation in Myanmar is an opportunity for, for Cambodia, just like, as Aaron was mentioning a while, just a, a little while ago, um, to, to make things right, you know? What, 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 what the right thing for Cambodia to do is that Cambodia need to exhibit a, a, a sincere commitment to the five-point consensus and to work together with all the ASEAN member states to try to restore normalcy to uh, uh, Myanmar now, the bold initiative, some write about uh, Prime Minister and send, uh, a proactive approach as a cowboy diplomacy. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't take it that far. But I think it's a bold initiative that he, he, he attempt to break the ice, of the stalemate, because it, it was not really, um, um, there's, there's no indication that there is a next step after Brunei, you know, they don't know how to reinvigorate it, the process, the, the so-called the five-point consensus. So he take this initiative, and I think it's a prelude. I, I do not um, agree with the reading that Aaron was saying that maybe there's a disconnect between uh, His Excellency Prasakon and Prime Minister Hun Sen in engaging Myanmar. Uh, I can say this uh, from the inside view that everything is very top-down here. You cannot have your own view without the agreement from the top, uh, particularly on foreign policy, such issues such as this one, you know? So I think um, that they, they compensate one another. The, 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 the statement that you mentioned about, uh, about His Excellency Prasakon want to invite the foreign minister and the visit of Prime Minister is, is to galvanize that uh, in my view, not, not to have any different um, bold initiative is definitely a, a deep divide, expose again the deep divides, but you cannot just analyze the situation as it is now. You need to go back when the five point consensus was originally adopted at the special summit in uh, Jakarta. At the time, only Min Aung Lai was invited. Remember? Uh, a lot of uh, statement about legitimacy that uh, ASEAN um, is uh, legitimize uh, the, the, the regime, the coup uh, and so on. And, and this is from the start, in my view, it's not very well uh, explained or very well uh, understood from uh, positions of ASEAN. And then uh, the selection of special invoice, if all of you follow it closely, particularly Aaron would know that it was supposed to be uh, Hassan Varajuda, uh, who former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia, was throw, uh, Indonesia throw the head first, and then followed by Malaysia and Thailand, the candidate, uh, sort of like a shortlisted. But all out of the blue, Brunei take a bold initiative to have its own as well. There was a lot of hiccup there. So, and then, you know, the, the so-called five-point consensus there's only this five point consensus, there's five line. There's no plan, there's no time frame. How are you supposed to do this with a situation like uh, in Myanmar? There was no master plan, there was no backup, there's no roadmap and so on and so forth. So there's many loopholes there, you know, to say the least. So having, and then even now when we talk about ceasefire, people wanted to see what's exactly this ceasefire is all about you know, the detail of it, which is very, very uh, uh, important. So my view about uh, this situation is that uh, Cambodia sees an opportunity. We want to, uh, we should work together hand in hand with our colleague ASEAN to ensure that the five point consensus is implementable. The question, the big questions about it is, is this, will ASEAN apply pressure when we deal with uh, the junta? So far, no. Uh, Cambodia take a position, uh, minimum, minimum pressure or no pressure, clean slate, no uh, string attached, no precondition. We want to just talk to you. We don't even demand to see uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, but if you think you, uh, you 
let us see it. It will be good that we see it. We see her, you know, and things like that. But um, see, the, that's the first thing. No pressure or some pressure. What pressures it should we apply? Second thing is about uh, recognizing who. Make sure that whatever we do, whatever ASEAN do or Cambodia do, is not lending itself to recognize the regime. This is why you see a leader from Singapore, Malaysia, and uh, and, and Philippines and Indonesia already go into the open and sort of like make statement about uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen visit. But bear in mind that if he doesn't break the ice, what's next? And therefore we should give the benefit of the doubt that Cambodia should be given an opportunity to carry on this mission. And as we know that Min Nong Lai is a problem but he is also a solution. Without him, there's nothing can happen, including the delivery of humanitarian assistance. To, to say the least, to engage uh, and UGs and so on and so forth, who's going to allow you to do that? You know, you look at the UN, what is it that the UN do? The EU, a big, big country, or the US, they all hide behind ASEAN now, you know, and kind of uh, let ASEAN doing the difficult work for them. But I, I, I think I should refrain from making more statement about this. But you have to give Prime Minister Hun Sen the benefit of the doubt. I support his, his, his initiative. I'm just hoping that the process through which there will be more consultation, that everybody is clear about his, uh, his move, and that everybody is happy with his move and get the answer from the question they want from him, from Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Cambodia. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ambassador Sotirak. Well, we're just about out of time. I just wanted to give Aaron, you know, any chance to, to weigh in on that question of the applicability of Cambodia's experience um, in the immediate post-Cold War period to Myanmar today. And if there's anything, any lessons that can be drawn there. No, I think they're very different situations and um, there's, uh, they're just extraordinarily different situations and, and probably very few lessons from Cambodia uh, that can be applied to Myanmar. But I, I would say, you know, um, engagement is, some level of engagement is probably required, um, but thus far engagement has not really produced results in Myanmar. Uh, if you look at the events that took place on the ground in Myanmar, the week that Hun Sen visited um, and the week that followed, uh, the atrocities have increased, um, particularly on the side of the military. Uh, and so it hasn't actually led to the kind of results that uh, one would hope uh, engagement not backed by pressure would lead to. Um, so the question is what sort of forms of pressure could ASEAN also apply to make its engagement more worthwhile? And I think, you know, you can imagine a couple forms. One is the form that has been pioneered by Foreign Minister Saifuddin in Malaysia by excluding ministerial level appointees from ASEAN meetings. By the way, there is one coming up that Myanmar is meant to chair at the end of the month. It's the digital ministers meeting. Um, and there's a question as to whether or not anyone will show up to that. I think that Japan and the U.S. have said that they won't attend that, um, even though they had last year. Um, and I think there's a question as to how ASEAN handles that. The other thing I, I just say is um, in the Bruneian chairman's statement that came out of the emergency ASEAN foreign ministers meeting in October, there was a reference to the NUG. It was the first time that ASEAN had recognized that there was another party to this dispute over the identity of the legitimate government of Myanmar and that it was the NUG. There's a very easy way for ASEAN to meet with the NUG uh, without violating or uh, having to you know, declare a new precedent or consensus. And that's for the ASEAN committee in New York, which is the ASEAN permanent representatives to the UN to just meet as they regularly would. They haven't met since the coup. Uh, and that is because uh, Chomo Tun is Myanmar's permanent representative to the UN as determined by the credentials committee of the UN General Assembly. And if ASEAN were to just meet as the ASEAN Committee of New York uh, in New York, uh, as they normally would, they would be meeting with the NUG. And that would be a form of putting pressure on the junta. And the last thing I'd say, just very briefly, is that these measures are not actually directed at Minong Klang, or not, would not be directed at Minong Klang. The exclusion of Minong Klang is not actually directed at Minong Klang. I don't think anyone believes that his behavior is going to change. They're directed at others in the Tomara. Uh, the Tomara is under enormous pressure more pressure than it has ever faced since the 1950s when it was fighting bandits and Kuomintang in uh, the hills of Shan State. And uh, it is very stretched. And there are all sorts of signs of this. And there must be many people in the Tomara who think that the February 1st coup was a mistake. 
and it would take a tremendous amount for them to risk their lives, their families' lives, their fortunes uh, to try and reverse that mistake. But there have been episodes in Tamara history uh, where splits have emerged within the leadership and a change in course has emerged from that split. And I think if, uh, if anything, pressure and engagement should be uh, designed to uh, lead to a, the emergence of a new leadership that would pursue a less hardline course. I don't think anyone believes it would be a, a softline course or a tain sane course, but a less hardline course that would present the space for diplomacy and for engagement to work. Wonderful. Alina, do you have any closing thoughts on Cambodia's approach to the Myanmar crisis, which we haven't really had a chance to speak about yet with you? So I'm, I'm torn about this. I understand the position of both sides. Um, and I understand the positions outlined by Master Sutrak and Aaron. So far, we've seen that ASEAN's approach hasn't really worked. Um, then again, it's only really been under the Brunei chairmanship for a year. Um, and given the Myanmar junta's intransigence for decades and decades, uh, one year is not much of an assessment. Um, and so I, I feel that perhaps there is an argument to be made to give um, Hun Sen the benefit of the doubt, Cambodia's approach the benefit of the doubt for now. The question is, at the same time, as Aaron pointed out, the number of fatalities and, and injuries that have continued to accumulate over that time. And so there's a political question as to whether to engage with how much pressure, but there's also a very real humanitarian consequence to that question. And I think the balance between that has to be decided on by the ASEAN member states, particularly those who profess to stick to human rights and all of the other good moral principles that ASEAN likes to um, talk about, at least rhetorically. So these two questions are separate, the political and the humanitarian one, but they're also very much interlinked. And I don't know the answer to that, but I, I feel that if there is the benefit of the doubt to be given, it shouldn't be at the cost of uh, human lives. And therefore, there should be a time frame to assess whether or not the, the current approach is working. Thank you. Well, I think we'll probably have to wrap things up there. We do have many more questions, and I'm sure we could keep this going for another hour easily. Um, but I'd like to, you know, on behalf of the diplomat, I'd like to once again extend my gratitude to our three panelists. Um, you know, you, your, all of your insights have been very illuminating and certainly um, added some more nuance to my own views of, um, of the situation in ASEAN right now and how Cambodia might... Um, <clears throat> you know, might, might uh, handle its chairmanship in the coming year. So thank you all again. Um, and, you know, if anyone is interested, this event will has been recorded and will be available on YouTube. We will be posting it to the Diplomats website. So keep an eye out on our Twitter feeds and Facebook page. Um, it should be there in the next few days. Thank you again.